if I had listened closely, I would have heard um, a clicking sound in the background. And what that would have been would have been the dominoes falling. It was a le leading with beauty. Um, and I felt a little bit mugged when I thought back upon it. I mean, I, I, beauty sort of snuck up on me. I ordered a copy of the, of the catechism, the big fat green catechism that you could use to change the oil in your car with if you had a couple of copies and propped it up. I was faced with this realization, it was a bit scary actually, that, that maybe the Catholic Church had a very coherent vision of, of reality. And I'll never forget the night I made the sign of the cross for the first time. Hey, it's story time again, and we have another conversion story for you. So last time we had Mrs. Ludwig sharing her story. Today is a completely different style. Everything about it is different. So Dr. George Harn is the president of Christendom College, used to be the dean at the University of St. Thomas in Houston, and he shares his story. And first of all, he's, he's a very scholarly gentleman, but he's got this artistic side. So as you heard in the introduction or the tease at the beginning, he said he was mugged by beauty. And this leads to a whole string of things, but that whole concept of being mugged by beauty is, first of all, an expression I've never heard of in my life, right? Nobody says that, uh, but such a cool way to talk about how God worked through his life. So check out his story. Uh, I think mugged by beauty captures a big part of my conversion. And the Eucharist was central to that. I had grown up as a, as a low church evangelical, and we took communion maybe once a quarter, and it was we saw it as a symbolic act, and it was important, uh, and it was always a special Sunday when we did that. But but it was pretty limited in terms of its its place in in our, our lives as Christians. Um, when I was in graduate school, I became more attuned to to liturgy, to the liturgical traditions of the church. And uh, even as undergraduate, I had been invited to go to a, a weekly Eucharistic service at my uh, undergraduate institution. And it was, it, and it was ecumenical, and, but it was the first time I had ever really seen a liturgy happen. And I went to uh, what, what would have been called a, a high Anglo-Catholic liturgy. And it was, on, it was actually on Corpus Christi, um, which is not supposed to be celebrated by Anglicans, but they were celebrating it. And um, with all the, what we would call the smells and bells of the liturgy. I, I was in New Jersey at the time, and this liturgy took place in Philadelphia, what was historically a very high Anglo-Catholic church. Again, not in communion with, with Rome, but holding on to the, the highest forms of English Christianity from before the Reformation. I was completely overwhelmed by what happened in that liturgy. Um, it was all about the Eucharist. It was all about the real presence. Uh, and um, they sang Gregorian chant. There, it was filled with incense. There was a procession of the Eucharist and the homily by the priest, again, not a Catholic priest, an Anglican priest, the homily was all about the real presence. And I confess it, that through, throughout that, I came to believe over the next, over that hour or so, that Jesus really was present in the Eucharist. A lot of that had to do with just the beauty of the, of the, of the liturgy. It, no one presented a rational argument to me, a syllogism, and, and, and tried to convince me through pure reason that I should believe that that, that was the case. The, the irony, of course, is that this was an Anglican <laughs> service, um, but that's what God used in, in my life and in, in my journey. And so what I didn't realize at the time, though, was that if you, if you come to believe that Jesus is in the Eucharist, a lot of other things have to be in place. You have to have a priesthood. You have to have priests who are validly ordained. Um, who can confect the Eucharist, who can who can bring that, that sacrifice about and renew it at the altar. You have to be prepared to receive the Eucharist, and that's where confession comes in. All of these things, all of these very Catholic things suddenly come rushing in. I joke that if I had, if I had listened closely, I would have heard um, a clicking sound in the background. And what that would have been would have been the dominoes falling um, and the dominoes that would ultimately lead me to become Catholic. And, and within a few years, I was, was, was Catholic, uh, but it all began, began there. And again, it wasn't a rational argument. It wasn't irrational or anti-rational, but it was a, it was a, it was a le leading with beauty. Um, and I felt a little bit mugged when I thought back upon it. I mean, I, I, beauty sort of snuck up on me. <laughs> mugged by the beauty of the liturgy. And that's what caused him to go on this uh, search 
for the truth. Unlike Mrs. Ludwig, who, after she was already in the church, came to grow an appreciation for it, he's on a search for the truth, which is then going to lead him eventually to conversion. So being an academic, of course, he's asking all kinds of questions. And this is the process that he goes through to find those answers. Well, after I was mugged, uh, I didn't know what was going to happen next. I, I began to continue to read. And the more I did, I, I came to realize just how unique the experience I had had in Philadelphia on that Corpus Christi was and how the, the broader Anglican tradition really didn't hold to the real presence. And so I was I was suddenly found myself a bit already isolated as, as, a, as an Anglican who believed in the real presence who, and wanted to believe in the, the more complete Catholic vision. Could I, where, do, where do I go? What, what do I do? And so I began to dig in and, and read more and more about the relationship between Anglicanism and Catholicism and, and its historical or, origins. A friend of mine uh, in, who attended my Episcopal church and was part of a, a, an organization called InterVarsity Christian Fellowship, one day he said to me, you know, let's, let's, read, let's read the Catholic Catechism together. And I will say, as, as uh, intellectual wannabes in graduate school, it was easy to kind of play around with Catholicism and sort of drop, you know, St. Augustine here and Thomas Aquinas there, and it was all rather pretentious. Um, but there was a level, I think, of real interest, of genuine interest in understanding the Catholic tradition. And so uh, I remember I, I ordered a copy of the of the catechism, the big fat green catechism that you could use to change the oil in your car with if you had a couple of copies and propped it up. Um, and I I began by reading it. And the first thing I did was, of course, I'm, I was a very arrogant graduate student. So what I, well, that's sort of redundant. But anyway, um, the uh, I was a graduate student and I thought I knew everything. And so I, I but I started off by reading all of the parts of the catechism about topics that I knew I disagreed with the Catholic Church about. Uh, Mary, for example, Our Lady, um, uh, indulgences, um, purgatory, all these things that I, I thought were had been corruptions of, of, of Christianity. And I discovered one of two things. Either the church didn't actually teach what I thought it taught, so I was wrong about what, what Catholicism said, or maybe I was right, but the teaching went way, way back. It went way back to the early parts of Christianity. And I, even as a graduate student, I wasn't prepared to contradict St. Augustine. So I was faced with this realization, it was a bit scary actually, that, that maybe the, the Catholic Church had a very coherent vision of, of reality. So I'll never forget the day that I had finished reading all the sections on the topics that I thought I disagreed with. I closed it and I started at the beginning. And I think that was a very grace-filled moment. That was a gift. It was a bit like the mugging that had taken place a few months earlier. Um, I should also say that this, this took place while I was still, I was praying morning prayer and evening prayer according to the Book of Common Prayer, the Anglican book, and then an Anglican breviary, which is a bit like the Roman breviary. Um, and I was going to daily Eucharist as much as I could as an Anglican. So there was a, there was a spiritual dimension in this happening uh, and unfolding too. But the intellectual side really came to the catechism. And then after that, many years before, uh, I had met a few Catholics. I didn't really know any Catholics, but I had met a couple. And they had these books on their shelf um, in, their, in their living room. And they were the documents of Vatican II. And it was blue with a yellow you know, binding. I remember thinking at the time just how unfortunate it was that they didn't understand what Christianity was really about, being Catholic, and again, my arrogance as a young person. But I remember those books. And so I thought, I, I wonder if I could find those books. And so um, I went and I, I ordered them and, uh, and I read them. So I read all the documents of Vatican II. The Holy Spirit in that process just planted a, the seeds of desire in me to be in communion. And it was, it was gonna be hard. It was gonna be hard. We, we, were, the only, we were not Catholic and um, uh, we were, there were no Catholics in our family. Didn't really know any Catholics. Um, but I found myself driving by my local Catholic church on a daily basis and slowing down. <laughs> um, and I'll never forget the night I made the sign of the cross for the first time. Um, and uh, right before I fell asleep. And that, that was a pretty momentous event. And again, it doesn't seem like a big deal to Catholics, but it was a big deal. Uh, but you know, I was being pursued. Um, uh, uh, I was being pursued and I didn't know it, but it was grace that was pursuing me. But at the very heart of that was the Eucharist. It was a desire to be united with Christ in the Eucharist. And when my evangelical friends would ask me, why are you becoming Catholic? I just said, it's, it's to get closer to Jesus. That's what it comes down to. That I gotta get closer to Jesus and the Eucharist is the way, so. So there's so much to this story, this story of the, the humility of an intellectual, you know, him going through the process of, of research and learning and growing and, and growing in truth and understanding. And then he talks about the sign of the cross, something that I do you know, several times a day, sometimes more, and often, sadly, don't put that much thought into it. It's just kind of a, a, 
going through the motions kind of a thing. But how powerful that is and such a good reminder for me. But the will was also a big part of this. When I, when I explained this to some of my friends, I, I would describe it as I'm submitting to the Bishop of Rome. So I was consciously aware that there was, a, there was an act of the will involved. You can reason yourself through a syllogism um, or be mugged by beauty, but at a certain point the will has to, has to kick in and you have to make a decision. You know, are you going to submit? And that's one of the things about Anglicanism is it's, you can get very, very close to Catholicism, but there's a giant wall. You can be on the ground, you can be six inches away from Rome, but there's a 100-foot high wall between you and, and Rome, and, and that's really private judgment. It's, it's one's own private decision to, I get to decide what I believe. I get to decide. It's about what I think is right. And there's a certain point you have to, you, have to, you don't check your brain out, you don't check out your reason at all but there's an active submission that happens. And I think you have to, I have to keep making that submission every day. Um, but it's liberating because once you do that, um, it sets you free. And then him sharing his experience of receiving the Eucharist for the first time, man, it's awesome, check it out. I'll never forget receiving the Eucharist for the first time. I mean, it was one of the situations where I went to confession the night before, received First Holy Communion the next morning and then had received confirmation that day, um, that next day. I remember going into the priest with a long, long list of sins because I, I, I think I was in my, I was in my late 30s when this happened. Um, and, uh, and I got about four or five into it. He said, I think that's, that's probably enough. <laughs> so we've heard enough. And, uh, but, uh, but the highlight, of course, was the next day, was receiving the Eucharist. And um, it, was a, it was a glorious, glorious time. So at some point you have to make a choice. And sometimes that's an easy choice. Sometimes it's a difficult choice. In the case of Dr. Harn, he's sacrificing his community because whenever he converts, he's leaving his community, his Christian community. That was one of the more challenging parts. Uh, my, my little Episcopal parish was a, was a, a wonderful community. Uh, it was hard to, to, to leave that behind. And, and for a while, we tried to do both. We would visit, we would, we would go to our, our Episcopal parish, um, and then we would go to Mass and, and while we were waiting to enter the church. And it was, it was, not, it was not easy. And, uh, but building up the visible communion uh, in a local parish takes time. And um, it's so easy to kind of go in and um, go to Mass and then walk out. And, and some parishes are, are more effective at building that community than others. But I think one of the things I, I learned pretty early on was that, that real communion is born in the Eucharist. And so there's a, there's a kind of concentric circles um, uh, system going on. Um, and if, if Christ is at the center in the Trinity, that communion of persons of the Trinity is in the center, then we're called to the Eucharist to be part of that, to enter into that that communion within the life of the Trinity. As we build up that communion of persons, um, even with, with, among Catholics, what ev evangelization essentially is, is bringing people into that communion. So that's sort of another layer, another, another circle. Um, so if the Trinity is at the very center and the Eucharist is at the center, and those of us who are in communion now are, you know, are, are a circle, then, then that, that next outer circle are those that, that we want to bring in into that communion. So it, I think before, before I became Catholic, I, I tended to think of communion as more of a social activity. And there is certainly a social dimension. And I mean, it, there's nothing quite, quite as wonderful as, as the kind of social community you can have among, among, among Catholics and among those who love God. But when you ground that in the Eucharist, when you ground that in, in communion with a capital C, it, it transforms everything. And it includes people you might not have normally concluded under, so, under normal social circumstances. It's much broader and much deeper. I love that. Communion is social, but not only social. And community is so important. Just like we heard last week, if you missed that, check it out. It's so good. These conversion stories are so powerful for me as a non-convert to hear other people's journeys and, and learn from it and grow from it and be challenged by it. And just for fun, before we go, uh, here is Dr. Harn talking about, well, Tolkien and you'll see. I'm by no means an expert on Tolkien. I've read it out loud a few times to my uh, to my kids, the Lord of the Rings, and uh, and so it and it was very formative in my own my own experience. In large part, I think because it it it, it gave me more of a Catholic imagination. Um, I didn't realize it, but I had my imagination had been had been colonized, if you will, and uh, fragmented. Uh, and I'd really, I had really, I had lost a sense of the narrative nature of reality. And uh, reading, reading Tolkien out loud to my kids helped sort of uh, reconstitute a narrative structure in, in my imagination, which was really important. Max Studios.